right. Um, all right. Well, welcome and uh, thanks everybody for tuning in this evening. Um, like uh, Jennifer said, uh, my name is Mike Houlihan. I'm the assistant curator of birds over at the Audubon Zoo here in New Orleans. I am somewhat newly arrived. I um, got here in December of last year, um, but I've been working with birds for about 20 years now. I recently, most recently came from the San Diego Zoo um, where I worked in, uh, in the bird department. And previous to that, I was also at the Bronx Zoo in New York uh, for several years, again, working with the birds. Um, what uh, I'm gonna talk a little bit about today is the work I got to do with California condors in the wild. And part of that is what took me kind of around um, to different zoos. Uh, I'm from New York, native there, so I would probably have stayed uh, at the Bronx Zoo for quite some time, but an opportunity came up with the Santa Barbara Zoo to actually uh, work as a keeper within the zoo, but also do work with California condors in the wild. So uh, I felt like it was a great opportunity for somebody in my field to actually go out and release um, endangered species out to the wild. It's kind of the reason why we're in this field and why we do what we do. Um, so it was, uh, it was an amazing opportunity that uh, took me across the country to try it out. And, um, I was very happy I did it. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with California condors, I'll just give you a little quick background on them and natural history. Um, it's a very popular story, especially amongst um, people who enjoy birds. So you may have some familiarity with it, but um, if not, the California condor is considered the largest soaring uh, land bird here in uh, North America. Um, it's a bird that's the only found here in North America, one of only two species of condors, the other being the Andean condor from uh, Central and South America. And uh, um, they were on the brink of extinction, uh, considered extinct in the wild at one point during the 80s. But previous to that, fossil records have shown that their range went from Great Britain, um, is that not Great Britain, uh, British Columbia, all the way down through Mexico. Um, there have been bones found in upstate New York as well as Florida. So their range was pretty much the entirety of the United States and parts of Central America and Mexico. Uh, today, you can only find them in um, most of Southern California and some of the Northern areas, Oregon, Washington, so their populations have started to come back up, um, New Mexico and Arizona and Baja, uh, Baja Mexico. Um, so it, it was a bird that had a pretty fair, fairly large range throughout the United States and then unfortunately had dwindled down. Um, the familiarity with the story that you may have heard in the past was in, in the early 1980s, a survey was done and it was discovered that uh, there were only about 22 of these birds left in the world. So throughout the entire world, um, California condors uh, were down to 22 and that is pretty much on the brink of extinction right there. So um, <clears throat> San Diego Zoo, LA Zoo, and um, US Fish and Wildlife, and what is now the condor, uh, California Condor Recovery Program, decided to bring those birds into captivity and start a breeding program to help uh, their populations get back up. So about 1987 or so, the 22 birds were brought into various zoos and breeding facilities uh, that were built specifically for them. And in 1988, I believe, was the first um, actual captive born in the beginning of the program right there. Uh, there was a lot of amazing things that were learned that, uh, throughout, these, throughout the years that have helped these birds kind of bounce back a little bit. Um, California condors uh, in the wild normally lay one egg a year. So it's kind of very limited. Uh, if something happens to the egg, there could be issues, and then um, they'll have to wait till next year. And that's part of the reason why their numbers uh, dwindled so fast, because they just don't reproduce as fast as some other birds or have a bigger clutch. Um, but what the zoos discovered was something called double clutching, which you may be familiar with. It's when uh, a female would lay an egg, they would take uh, that egg away, incubate it, artificially incubate it, and uh, hand raise the chick, and then allow the female to recycle and lay another egg. So we get, we get two eggs out of one female per breeding season. It was a way to double those numbers uh, of the breeding population there, which was a, a, a great innovation that has helped out uh, a lot of bird species in captive breeding today. Um, Another innovation they had was puppet feeding. Uh, when I say they were hand raised, uh, part of the problem with that is birds do have a tendency to become somewhat imprinted on people and reliant on us as food. So we didn't want these animals to be released to the wild and turn back around and come to looking for people for food because that's where you run into problems when a big uh, 10 foot long wingspan bird lands in your backyard uh, looking for handouts. Um, people aren't always fond of that. So they actually did puppet rearing where they had puppets that were designed and made to look just like California condors and um, to feed the chick. This way they would never associate people with food. The practice at San, uh, San Diego Zoo right now in their wild animal park uh, is pretty much very hands off with, the, with their birds. They 
um, have them in flight pens and they observe them through blinds where the people cannot be seen. Um, food is all given out through trees and kind of uh, tossed out into the area. Um, and then the birds gradually move up to bigger flight cages until they're um, ready for release. Uh, when I worked at San, uh, Santa Barbara, we had uh, three juvenile males. Santa Barbara wasn't a breeding facility, but we were a uh, facility to hold younger males or younger um, birds until they were sexually mature at about four, uh, four to six years old to be either released to the wild or back out and, or put into the breeding program. Um, same, similarly there, we had a very no, uh, no contact with the, with the birds. They were all fed um, separately where they couldn't see us. And again, it was just a way to kind of disconnect us from them. Part of the problem with California condors in the wild were like most vultures, people see them as a sign of death and something bad, or some people even uh, think that they're eating their cattle and stuff. So ranchers would occasionally shoot them and trap them, and, um, which was one of their biggest issues going forward. Uh, so again, it was all just an effort to make sure that the birds don't connect with people at all. Um, it's a little different in the wild. When, we got, when I got the opportunity to work out there, it was part of, um, it's called Bitter Creek is the uh, national uh, park up there. And it's one of uh, I believe three stations in Ventura County in Los Padres National Park uh, that have bait stations. And within the bait stations, um, food is put out, usually cattle that was uh, donated by one of the local ranchers and birds are allowed to come in and out. And then every so often, depending on what the fish and wildlife needs are, we are able to trap them into these pens and then net them out and uh, give them a workup, change the radio um, uh, telemetry, the color tag that numbers each individual bird. And we also do blood draws. And <clears throat> excuse me. The reason for the blood draw is uh, to test lead levels. One of California condors biggest problems in the wild right now is uh, lead poisoning. So when hunters go out um, and hunt things like deer, um, whatnot, they'll you know, shoot with a lead shot they take back what they need, leaving bits and pieces behind. Condors being vultures are gonna come down and look to eat uh, the leftover carcasses. Unfortunately, the lead bullets actually bleed out into the skin or the bulb or into the meat, um, and the California condors then get lead poisoning. And lead poisoning it happens to be a neurological uh, problem where the birds can't fly, can't eat, just don't act normal. And if you've ever seen if you, the unfortunate videos of a lot of bald eagles that have been affected by it, it does not look like a very pleasant way to to die. It's, a, it's pretty brutal. Um, and so California actually has initiatives to push to get away from lead shot. And it's backed by a lot of hunters. So it's not that we're saying we don't want people out there hunting. We just want them hunting responsible and making sure that you're not leaving um, lead shot, blood out, uh, you know, carcasses for condors to find because that, that becomes an issue for them. It's a, it's a big issue um, that is one of their huge roadblocks to kind of succeeding and coming back. Uh, another one is something called micro trash, and it's just small bits of trash that may not mean much to you or I, but a lot of times condors will actually take that micro trash back to the nest and feed the young, who then choke on it. Um, so it's a big issue with, you know, hikers and things, just making sure that we're not leaving, you know, things, uh, things around that we shouldn't. Thankfully, a lot of the areas where California condors are found in California are off limits to people, uh, at least to a degree where you wouldn't be crossing paths with one. You can probably see one from a distance. Um, the first wild ones I saw was actually over the Grand Canyon, which was pretty impressive. Um, but there are a lot of steps being taken by Fish and Wildlife that are there to help these animals in the wild, um, making sure public education is a big uh, step forward as well, too, making sure people are aware of the issues that happen, things like lead and micro trash, um, telephone wires, electrical wires, are always issues as well with them. Um, there is a big, big push. Californians do love their condors, and they very... Um, they back a lot of these initiatives that help um, help these animals in the wild. There are a few ranchers and landowners out there who actually allow the fish and wildlife to come and use their land to study the birds. Uh, fish and wildlife have nest technicians who will sit up in blinds uh, for days at a time watching a nest and monitoring chicks, making sure the chick is progressing, making sure the chick is growing, getting fed, the parents are returning. Um, so there's very closely watched species right now and Currently, um, the population is around 500. It may have, you know, I think it may have tipped over 500 at some point, but a milestone was passed a few years back where more California condors exist in the wild than they do in captivity. So their numbers are coming back. They are breeding out there, and that's a very important sign. Uh, one of the, um, another great milestone is that we're seeing birds that were raised in captivity um, 
mating and raising young of their own. So our, our efforts to make sure that we're not um, associating people with food and allowing the bird to be a bird are actually working. We're seeing the results of that being uh, generations of uh, wild-born birds. Um, and then there are certain ones that are returning to different areas. If you follow their story up in Oregon and Washington, there are pairs that have bred successfully up there. Um, they use a lot of the old growth, large redwood forests uh, to nest down in Southern California. They'll nest up on top of cliffs that naturally exist in um, the, the canyons that they live in. Uh, so they're, they're pretty good at using a variety of different types of uh, nest areas and wooded areas. They're not considered migratory, but they're considered um, a bird that can, like I said, utilize just about every aspect. If you think of their historic range from upstate New York to Florida to California and Mexico, it's a wide variety of um, environments that they would live in. So they're pretty well adaptable, which uh, is one of the things that is helping, helping them keep their populations going. Um, long before the California condor program was initiated, um, Andean condors were the focus of conservation in zoos. The Andean condors actually became kind of the, um, the stepping stone for California condors. And some of those birds were actually released in the United States to kind of test out if California condors could survive in the wild. Um, so those programs continue today down in South America, uh, places like Ecuador and Peru where the birds are in decline. Um, and again, it's a lot of efforts for zoos um, and environmental organizations down there that are putting forth to do similar things with the Andean condor um, than, and the California condor. Um, also, Andean condors here in the United States and are, are generally bred for a breeding program to be or to be released to the wild, similar to Californians as well. And it's an important aspect that people might not know about zoos, but zoos involved in conservation programs like this are very important and have made a huge difference in species like the California Andean condors. And here at home um, in Louisiana, the whooping crane, which uh, sounds like next week you'll have um, someone talking a bit more about that. But a lot of those similar tactics were used in getting their populations back up. You know, the population here in Louisiana and the migratory population that comes from Canada down to Texas was in decline and zoos uh, like Audubon Zoo uh, have stepped in and started breeding programs. Uh, we have our um, species survival center uh, out here, which is a large open area where, they, where they're bred in captivity. And again, it's all very hands-off. The, the animals don't really see the people. They're not fed by them. They're not associated with that. So there's puppet rearing um, and there's uh, double clutching. There's incub artificial incubation. Um, they've taken it a step further than just the puppet on the hand where the keepers are actually in full costume uh, to look more like a whooping crane since these birds will be out walking around. But um, there are great efforts that are made within zoos for species like this to help them survive. Uh, we continue to do that. Many visitors that come to the zoo are a big help because that money is going to help to go to those programs and hopefully save more of these species that are in decline. Um, yeah. Uh, like I said, I, I got the opportunity to go up to um, one of the stations in California. And that day we caught, uh, the first day I did it, we caught 19 birds. And we bled them all, retagged the ones that needed them, and then got to re-release them back out to the wild. Again, a huge, huge thrill for me, a great point in my career. Um, but it was also really nice to see when they do the lead, uh, lead tests for the blood, uh, only two out of the 19 birds had come back with high levels of um, lead toxicity. And they had to go to they go to LA Zoo to their veterinary hospital and their um, they do lead abatement on their blood, but it shows that some of the efforts the um, the education and getting the public involved had kind of it's kind of working you know it's working pretty well because if we didn't have those pushes to change things like lead shot I guarantee you probably more than two of them would have would have had that and probably fewer would have made it to be released back out to the wild. So uh, that was encouraging to see. And again, like I said, their numbers are coming back, still a ways to go, but um, you know, the efforts of zoos out there in California and uh, the other states, as well as uh, the Fish and Wildlife and the Condor Re uh, Recovery Program uh, are all important tools to have to help these species survive. And um, it makes a difference. There's a laundry list of other species, um, not just birds that zoos have helped bring back from the brink of extinction. Uh, over the years. So uh, you know, there's, there's a lot more going on behind the scenes sometimes that people don't realize that it's a big effort um, because we stand by our conservation status and our conservation messages to make sure that we're, we're actually putting it into practice as well too. 
Um, yeah, I guess if anybody has any questions about California condors or um, zoo birds, uh, feel free to fire away now.